Hi, my name is Annette Bodovic and I am the historian behind Discovered Lights of Pen Back History. And actually I do write here, uh, here I am sitting in Rickerton House in Jane Deans' bedroom. And I also write in Rickerton House and Homebush as well, so I'm absolutely delighted and very nervous to actually be here um, touching on the, the story of um, John and Jane Deans and uh, the love story that has so influenced uh, the oldest suburb here in Christchurch. So here we are in Jane's room. This was her room from 1856. So Rickland House, uh, which is very lovingly known by the locals as the Taj Mahal of, of, of Canterbury Bed or Christchurch. And uh, because, it, yeah, and I'll tell you why, is because of how Jane was sort of left um, a widow just after this, just over two years of marriage. And, uh, and this really was her tribute to the man that she loved. And, and once you hear the story, she was absolutely an amazing woman and, and uh, just so strong. For such a tiny little thing, she was really robust and, and very special lady. So this was um, Jane's bedroom from 1856 right through to her death in 1911. She actually passed away in this room, I believe. And, uh, and uh, no matter how big Wickland House got over the years, she, she stuck herself in this wee corner and, and just very humble, humble lady who put her family first and things like that. Um, so I guess the, one of the main things I guess behind Rickland House is, is the love story. And um, so John and Jane actually, their fathers were actually friends. And how they came to kind of um, come close and to start their courtship was that um, John wanted to learn farming. And uh, so John Dean Senior approached his very good friend James McElrath and said, would you take John on as cadet? And the, the old term of cadet is, is that you go somewhere as an apprentice, but you actually pay for the honour. So when John actually um, accepted that he would go to James McElrath, um, their farm was called Aquaflower, and, um, and he actually paid to be trained. Not only that, uh, he would board with the family and pay for food and things like that. So uh, quite an interesting way of having an apprenticeship when you're paying your own way through it. Anyway, so that was where it all began. Now, when John, when John Deans moved in with the McElraths, um, Jane was actually, who was the eldest daughter, actually was away at finishing school. And when she came back um, from finishing school, to her horror, there was this young man living and eating at the family table and, uh, and sleeping in the family, family rooms. And she informed her father, in no certain terms, that you will ruin my reputation. But, uh, and she just declared to herself, I will not like this, this John Deans, I will not, I will not. And actually, Jane spent most of her teenage years racking her brain about why everyone expected her to be married to a childhood friend of hers, Gave, uh, Gavin Brackenridge, which he, he was a very good friend with John too. The two men actually wrote to each other right up to John's early death in 1854. So again, the, if that, that, that young group that lived in, in Ayrshire, they were all very close, same church, so it, it was quite a wee youth group, you know, moving around, so an interesting wee triangle there. And um, John had no doubt of Jane's frosty uh, reception of him, and he actually went after her cousin who rejected him. And uh, so the, the love for John and Jane didn't start, it was a rocky road to love. Um, but by the time that um, William Deans, the older brother, was leaving for New Zealand, John and Jane had become very close. And they had a picnic at Knock Dolan, and, uh, and apparently they walked away from the other picnickers, went up a hill, and took the first real good look at each other, thinking to each other, could we make it in New Zealand? And John was very, very quick to, to say, I, he didn't, he didn't get, they didn't get engaged that day. There was an agreement because John believed Jane was too young, too young to make that kind of decision. And again, he wanted to come over to New Zealand and make sure that he'd like to hear before taking Jane away from everything that she knew. And it's a big thing to ask of a young lady as well. Now, as a parting gift, um, apparently according to Jane's unwritten memoirs, again and again and again, he asked for her to reassure that, he, that she would wait. And um, as a wee token before he left, he gave her what they call kid glo um, gloves. And they were actually on display here um, in, in her room so that you can see them. And on the envelope in her handwriting is the reason and the history uh, behind those gloves. And that was John's wee departing gift from Jane when he left New Zealand and uh, left Scotland, sorry, in 1842. So the gloves are still very much um, in her room and uh, are shown to all visitors who are interested in the history as well. 
So unbelievably, <clears throat> Jane was left at Aukenflower and what she did, and uh, so John came over here, she had to wait um, for him to sort of get himself set up, which he did, but it did take 11 years for him to finally get back to her and say, right, are we going to do this? And uh, so she hadn't really, and there apparently hadn't been much correspondence between the two. So what an amazing amount of faith that they both had in each other, especially when he heard through family members that Jane had gotten married and, uh, and she had heard that John had married a Maori princess. So it was, a, it was definitely not an not a easy road for the pair of them, but by 1850, John knew that the Canterbury Association settlers were on their way over here, and he finally felt, I can give Jane the life, she's going to have a bit of, a bit of more of a social situation, because it was pretty isolated here before the first four ships, and, um, and there's going to be more people coming, and, and a bit more of a life here, so he felt he was ready to do that, and he wrote, and the poor guy nearly went insane, can you imagine three months by sea just to get the letter to the, uh, to the McElraths, and he had to wait for the reply and Jane was in no hurry to, to get back to him so he had a very anxious time of it as well. A bit of a tragedy hit though with John even once the wedding plans got underway and that was uh, William drowned just off the coast of Wellington um, and he was heading over to Homebush in Sydney, Australia to buy stock for the Dean's estate of Homebush which is still out in Darfield. So that put the wedding plans even a year behind um, because John just couldn't, you know, William wasn't here and John had to make sure the place was well established uh, before that as well. So the first families that arrived here uh, in 1843, now John had gone to Nelson, William had gone to Wellington, things hadn't quite panned out the way they wanted, um, and the, the brothers united with the Gibby and the Manson families, who were also from Ayrshire, and they had come over. Uh, John Gibby was a good stocksman, and Samuel Mason, Mason was uh, a carpenter, a tradesman. So that's what they, the deans needed to help establish themselves over here. And in, 18, in February 1843, they actually arrived here, and the Gibby stayed at Port Levy with the other men coming over, uh, including Jimmy Robertson Clough, who was the man who showed William Putteringamutu, which is a Maori word for William, for, for Rickerton. And uh, that was sort of how that got started. So the very, very first um, building here was a, a, a big barn. Um, if you go out to Kahu Road, there's actually an oak tree and a plaque acknowledging that history. And that was the very first house to be built on the Canterbury Plains. Uh, and uh, that was torn down in 1897 by Jane, probably a very, very hard decision to make. But later on, in 1843, the Dean's Cottage uh, was made. And uh, that's, that, that is the oldest building now in Canterbury, on the Canterbury Plains, and an absolute uh, gem for, to go and visit, and things like that. So that was built by Samuel Manson, and uh, with William Deans helping out. And then in July 1843, John arrived from Homebridge, Sydney, with um, the Canterbury's first Merinos sheep, and Canterbury's first um, Clydesdales. And they all, pop it, they all arrived pregnant, uh, so the Deans soon had quite a good stock going here at Rickerton as well. Um, so, um, but when, when uh, John went back to get Jane from Scotland because she refused to come out with, uh, well she would have gone out as, as, under the um, guardianship of, of an older couple, being a young unmarried lady, but no, she said no, you can come home and get me. So John did that after everything was sorted out here at Rickerton and at Homebush, they were under the care managers, and John went home to Scotland. Now he, um, when he was in Panama, he was on a mule, and uh, he got caught in a rainstorm and got very, very unwell. And uh, unfortunately, that settled on his chest. And I have actually spoken to the Dean's family about that, uh, about that, and they do believe that John wasn't quite well before he even set sail, which is why this, the, the storm that he was in and, and the, the cold that settled and the cough that settled on his chest was because he was not ro very robust to start off with. So by the time he got back to Scotland, he developed a bit of a cough and he just, it was a bit like the flu, he just couldn't get rid of. And he visited the doctor while he was there and uh, everyone believed that when he returned to New Zealand with a warmer climate, that actually would um, sort out that. And so um, John and Jane arrived back here in February, uh, February the 2nd, 1853. And a lovely wee twist there that Jane, when they got Jane off the boat, she had lunch at the Mitre, which of course is still in Lutterton. And uh, that was actually opened December 1849 by Major Hallbrook. But uh, that's where she had her first uh, taste of fresh bread and butter. 
and she said it was absolutely um, a very delightful uh, feat to have right off the ship. And then they went over the V Hill on the bottle path, and um, because she was so frail, and not only that, she was she had seasickness, culture shock, and she was already pregnant. So you can imagine those three months at sea, she swore that she'd never get back on the ship, and that she never did. And um, so she spent the night in Kashmir under the uh, care of Reverend Buckle. And the very next day, unfortunately not with John beside her, but she came home to Rickerton and uh, her, got, got her first impressions of Christchurch and things like that. And uh, unfortunately, John just got sicker and sicker. He, just, he didn't improve uh, with the weather. And, by, um, and she gave birth to wee John Deans, little Johnny Deans, and, uh, and he was ten and a half months old when John Deans passed away in the Deans cottage. But just before he died, the two of them would sit quietly together and they still made their plans, even though he knew he wouldn't be here. And, uh, and strong in their faith, their Presbyterian faith in God, they knew that they would meet again and uh, their plans were laid out together as if he would be here. And one of those big things that they talked about was the building of Rickland House. And that was started a year after John died in 1855, even a year, year, just a year after that, that it was started. And uh, Jane uh, thought the, bills, the builders were taking far too long, so she actually moved into Rickland House before they even finished it. There were even some rooms that didn't even have floorboards in them, and her wardrobe was pulled up by a crane and brought in through the window. Uh, so just a, a cute story about when Jane uh, moved in here. And this was the room that she was always that she always was in as well. Now little Johnny grew up, and uh, when John died in her grief, she made a decision that she was going to live for her son and to protect the, the inheritance of uh, Rickerton and Homebush. And in, in 1874, John, little Johnny came of age and uh, he actually uh, received the deeds to Rickerton and Homebush. And, uh, and this Rickerton house went through stage two of its building and then he had 12 children, uh, eight surviving. And so stage three in, in 1900 gives you the Rickerton house that you know today. But there was another we built done in around 1906, I, I believe, and um, and the, the, this roof, it's, uh, the roof got raised, and there was a few changes done after Jane Deans passed away. So you can see why they, they refer to this beautiful heritage home in the middle of Rickerton, which the Deans named after their parish back, back in Scotland, the Taj Mahal. It really is a tribute of a woman's love for a man that she waited for for 11 years in good faith that he would, he would keep his promise. And, uh, and even after he passed away, after less than well, two years of marriage, she stayed here and she protected his, his legacy uh, and, and the rest of the Dean's family is history. So I'm so, um, so pleased to be in here. This wee armchair, before I go, was actually in the uh, cabin of the, uh, on the ship. So absolute a blessing to be sitting in it and, uh, and, and feel contact with the story in that way. Anyway, I hope you've had a lovely time with me. Thanks for listening. It really means the world that you take an interest in what uh, and in the stories I love to tell people. And uh, we'll see you next time on location. Have a wonderful day.